Boker Tov Givin. Boker Tov. Kyle Lachi. Mashlom Kha. Boker Tov. Mashlom Kha. Oh, no. Tov. Tov Meod. Okay, good. I had to pick on him. Right, we're going to report to his wife how he says he's doing. <laughs> all right, great. Well, uh, let's go first of all to the review of the vocabulary. Remember that on Thursday we will have a vocabulary quiz over chapters 14, 15, and 16. That's a change. All right, that's a change. We'll have a vocabulary quiz over chapters 14, 15, and 16. So let's begin on, on page 100 at chapter 14 and read through the vocabulary. Re'a. Re'a means friend, comrade, companion, or fellow. It's a very common term in Hebrew. Uh, you'll find it used very often. And then we have mitzvah. mitzvah. In, in modern Hebrew, that's pronounced mitzvah. And that means command or commandment. Uh, the plural is mitzot. And then we have the next word on the far left there is kaka. 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 I know that sounds very strange, especially in light of the recent election and comments made by a certain uh, former senator. But uh, it means so, thus, or as follows. So, thus, or as follows. Notice that the accent is on the first syllable. And then we have a sow. A sow is the proper name Esau. Alme. Alme. Alme means why. Literally, uh, upon or concerning what or concerning how. And so it's just taken together as meaning why. Aver. Aver. It means he passed by or he crossed over. It's used of crossing over a river. It's used, uh, for example, when God passes by Moses when he hides him in the cleft of the rock. And so aver is a very common word. It's the same word we get the word Hebrew from. A Hebrew is one who has crossed over. And uh, ivri is the Hebrew, and it's from the same root, the ayin beth resh root. Rav. Rav. Rav means many or numerous. Uh, this is an important word. In Aramaic, it has a different meaning. It means great. In Aramaic, it has to do with uh, quality. In Hebrew, it has to do with quantity. Uh, in some places in the Old Testament, it talks about, for example, in Psalm 19, it talks about uh, great transgression. And it's not great in the sense of quality. It's great in the sense of quantity. So it has to do with an abundance of transgression or it has to do with many transgressions. Rav in Hebrew has to do with quantity, not quality. Chad? I believe in our exercise for this week, um, the word ravdim appeared. Why does that need to be made plural? Uh, it's, as all adjectives, it will agree with the noun that it modifies in definiteness, in gender, and in uh, number. Okay, and also rabim is used in kind of like a, a noun. It can refer to 10,000 as well when it's a plural. All right, the next word is pakad. Pakad, pakad means he visited. It can mean he provided for. It can mean he cared for. Uh, I like this term and the way it's translated, visited, it, it's the same with a uh, verb we have in the New Testament as well that uh, visit is not just the idea of come and pass the day. It's actually to go to in order to provide a need. And uh, it's, it's a very important word. It, it, when it talks about provided for or cared for, sometimes it's the context of judgment. And so it can actually be translated in certain contexts as he judged when God is the subject. Uh, the word, next word is pause. Pause, pause means pure gold. The last word uh, for chapter 14 is sade. Sade. sade means field or country. And then let's go to chapter uh, 15 vocabulary on page 105. Kafav. Kafav. He wrote. Karath. 
He cut. And if covenant is the direct object of cut, it means literally to cut a covenant, but it means really to establish a covenant, to initiate a covenant, to make a covenant. And uh, the verb cut is sometimes used with covenant because oftentimes animals were sacrificed at the initiation of covenant. All right, the next verb is kala. He finished or he completed. Geshem. Geshem. Geshem is a word for rain. Uh, it usually has to do with a, a rain that is a heavy rain, a heavy rain. Ulai. Ulai. Ulai means perhaps. Naval. Naval. You're familiar with this word because it's the name of uh, Abigail's husband, Nabal, the man who died uh, when his heart turned to stone. And believe me, I thought about that often over the last two weeks <laughs> when they started talking about uh, my heart being hard in certain places and that uh, they talked about stenosis, which means it became hardened like stone. And I thought, well, that's what happened to Nabal. It was his whole heart that turned that way. So I was praising the Lord. My whole heart didn't turn that way. But Nabal means fool. It means literally it, it has to do with one whose heart is closed to spiritual matters, who has no sensitivity to spiritual things. And that's uh, part of the uh, uh, concept here. And there's almost a play on word here that is used when he dies of a, of a uh, heart that is turned to stone. Torah. Torah. Torah means law or strength, or excuse me, instruction, law or instruction. And it's hard to tell in some uh, passages which we should use, instruction or law. It comes from the root word yara, yod resh he, which means he pointed out. And so it's the idea of pointing out a way to instruct by telling what to do, where to go. And uh, so Torah has a lot of different meanings and you have to watch it very carefully, but in most cases you're safe in just translating it as law. Shanaim. Shanaim, notice the dual ending there, the ayim, that means two, two. Shilosha. Shilosha means three. Notice the holam is the same dot as the dot over the sheen that follows the lamed. So it serves two purposes, shilosha. Arba'a means four. Chemisha means five. Shisha means six. Shiva means seven. Shimona means eight. Tisha means nine. And if your text has their law or instruction below that, cross it out. That is a printing error. Somehow it got brought over from Torah. Does yours have it there? Yes. Okay, just cross it out. It doesn't belong there. Esara means 10. Now notice here you have two through 10. Echad means one. Echad is one. The reason you have all the feminine forms here given first is that these numbers that are in feminine are used with masculine nouns. They're used with masculine nouns. So it's kind of an irregularity. So we'll teach those to you first because masculine nouns dominate. Yarash. Yarash. He possessed or he subdued. Question, John? I was just curious, with those, those numbers spelled out like that, how is that compared to when we were at the beginning with the letters, the Aleph, and the one? Uh, yeah, the Aleph, Beth, Gimel that represent numbers, that's like using a number one, a number two, a number three. Uh, that's the number itself. But this is the word that you say for the number. Like we say nine, we can write the curly Q that's a nine. That'd be like writing a taith. But we say nine, N-I-N-E is the name. And these are the names. Okay, so the uh, Shinayim would be Baith as a number. The Shilosha would be the Gimel as a number. And the Arba'ah would be a Daleth as a number, etc. Okay, good question. Oyev. Oyev, Oyev means enemy. Afo. 
A foe means where or what kind, where or what kind. Uh, in most cases, it means where. It seldom means what kind, except in Judges 8.18 that you had in a exercise. I think exercise 13, it was put in too early. <laughs> and so we didn't uh, count that one. We removed it. Dr. Bushnan has told you to omit it. Harag. Harag. He slew or he killed. Tselem. Selim. means image. Uh, nekeva, nekeva is the word for female. Zakar, Zakar is the word for male. And Tavor, Tavor is a proper name. Tabor. Now that's the largest piece of vocabulary that you have. Let's turn to chapter 16 and go over the vocabulary there as well. Chapter 16, Od. Ode. Means again or still. Ache, Ache. means how. Barit, Barit is the word for covenant. Rachel, Rachel. is the proper name Rachel. Rivka, Rivka. is Rebecca. Eighth. Eighth, it means time. Notice that it sounds the same as the direct object marker. Eighth, but that's spelled with an aleph, and this eighth is spelled with an ayin. They sound alike, but they're spelled differently. So with an ayin, it means time, time. Etzem, Etzem. means bone. Shaver, Shaver. he broke. Ganav. Ganav, he stole. It can also mean he kidnapped. Joseph uses this verb when he says, I was indeed kidnapped from Egypt and he uses ganav. Paga, Paga, he touched, he met, or he entreated. Uh, he touched is the one that's most often used, and paga, when it's used of touching, is usually in a negative connotation. If the hand of God touches someone to smite them with leprosy, paga will be used. And uh, sometimes it's used in the sense of to plague someone. Paga. Awon. Now, awon is pronounced as though it, the wow is a consonant as well as a vowel. Uh, th it's actually just a wow consonant with a holum. So it's awon, or if in modern Hebrew, it's avon. Avon. So that wow is pronounced as a consonant, and it's a simple holum instead of a holum wow. Awon. You don't know that unless you're told. <laughs> There's no way to tell it by the writing. Mashal. Mashal. He ruled. And zona, zona means harlot or prostitute. Lakain means therefore. I believe we've had alkain that means the same thing. Lakain, therefore. Chok means statute or decree. The plural is hukim. Notice that's a, a uh, U-class vowel there and a doubling doggish in the kof in the uh, plural. Chok, statute. Make certain you spell that correctly. Don't spell it statue, S-T-A-T-U-E, but S-T-A-T-T-E. So put three T's in it there, statute or decree. Mishpat. Mishpat. Mishpat means judgment or ordinance. Aid. Aid. Aid means testimony or witness. It can be used both of laws that are called testimonies and it can also be used of one who gives a witness. Um, very important word. Okay, any questions on these three chapters of vocabulary? Scott. Uh, just regarding uh, the last chapter, it says also the Yiktal form of Shemar. We're not going to cover that on this vocab quiz. We're going to save that. Okay? So just what is given under vocabulary on those three chapters? Good question. Okay? All right. Let's turn back to chapter 14 then in the time we have left today because I can only teach half classes this week. And since I'm going back to the doctor on Friday, I have to make certain I obey. Besides, my wife is home checking on me. She said she'd call my office to make certain I got back to my office after a half class. So, <laughs> got a lot of people checking on me. 
pronominal suffixes is something you may have covered a little bit with Dr. Busnitz, but I want to make certain we review it and we're going to make certain we cover everything that was supposed to be covered while I was gone. I want to make certain we go back and review. Uh, part of that is because we want to make certain we have it on DVD, but also I just want to make certain that you get the directions that I give to you and also some of the ways that I teach it that perhaps Dr. Busnitz uh, does not use that at least to me seem to make it easier. And some of the ways he taught for some of you may have seemed easier and some of you will find it easier with me and that's all the better that we have two different approaches because I want to try to make certain that all of you understand these. Pronominal suffixes really help you to understand how the Hebrew says something like my book my house, your house, his house, his word, their words. Uh, this is how we do it in Hebrew. In English we say, say it with these possessive pronouns. We don't use the personal pronouns to show possessiveness in Hebrew. The personal pronouns are reserved for primarily being subjects. And so as we look at these things, to be able to have objects and to be able to have possession with a pronoun requires that we use pronominal suffixes. So we have a number of suffixes to cover. First of all, those on nouns, and that's probably all we'll get to today. We change the absolute form of the noun, like the word davar, word, matter, or affair, to its construct form. In sus, the word for horse, there's no change because you have a characteristically long vowel that will not change at any time. But if you change it to susa in the feminine, a mare, then we have to go to the construct susath, susath, and we'll add the pronominal suffixes to the construct form. On davar, we go to devar, devar, and add the pronominal suffix to it. So it's like saying, horse of me, the horse of me. Anytime you have a pronominal suffix on a noun, it makes that noun definite. So it's actually the horse of me, the horse of me. So instead of saying my horse, the Hebrew says the horse of me. But the the is understood because of the pronominal suffix. That the pronominal suffix identifies it as a specific horse. It is his horse as opposed to her horse. It's your horse as opposed to my horse. So it makes it a definite horse by doing that. So as we look at that then, to say my horse, we add the hiric yod, the same hiric yod we saw on anoki and ani, the first person personal pronoun, that you put on katal ti, when we talked about he killed, or katav ti, uh, or I wrote, I, I uh, killed, katal ti, I killed, katav uh, ti, I wrote, mashal ti, I ruled. Uh, that same hiric yod goes on the end to say my horse, literally the horse of me. Your horse, the masculine singular, is suska. You'll notice that the second person Pronominal suffixes all have a kaf in them. Second person pronominal suffixes all have a kaf. Whether it's masculine or feminine, whether it's singular or plural, the second person has a kaf. So get used to seeing the kaf as a ending on a word. Suska is uh, your horse. And excuse me here, it's not a silent schwa notice. It's suska. Su is an open syllable, and uh, it's a long vowel. So that means the psalmic with the schwa has to begin the next syllable. It begins the next syllable, and so it's vocal. Susake is your horse if it's a female that you're speaking of. And then suso is his horse. So e is I, ka is you masculine singular, ache is you feminine singular and O is masculine singular. And ah, you have to pronounce the ma peak by, by putting some breath in that last hey. So it's susah, susah. Not as heavy as if it were a uh, chaith. It's not like a chaith. It's not susah, but susah. And you have to put that uh, heavy breathing sound in there. And that makes it her horse, her horse. 
So if you see a ma peak in the hay at the end of a word, that's a good clue that you probably have a third feminine singular pronominal suffix. It would be her. And then our horse is Susainu. Susainu, like Nachnu or Anachnu. Just you had Katalnu, uh, Mashalnu, Katavnu. That new ending is still the first common plural, so it's our horse, Susainu. Your horse, Suskem. Notice the kaf there, and then the Segol main. And notice here again, you've got that open syllable. It's su sekem, su sekem. Su sekem with the noon is the feminine. And susam is their masculine plural, their horse, susam. And susan with the noon is their feminine plural horse. Okay, let's go back through this and pronounce these and go through, okay? Susi. Susi. Susika. Susika. Susaik. Susaik. Suso. Suso. Susa. Susa. Susainu. Susainu. Susakem. Susakem. Susaken. Susaken. And notice that's why, since you have that, you don't have a dogish in the kaf here. If the dogish were in the kaf, this, the samic before it would be closing the preceding syllable and be a silent schwa under it. If it were a silent schwa, then you'd have to have a dogish, the hardening dogish in the kaf. So this tells you that it's vocal, susakem, susakem. All right, susam, susam. susan, susan. susan. Okay, they're horse. Then we go to the feminine. Remember, for the feminine, we had to go to the construct form susath, susath. But what happens when we add the pronominal suffix is the ath on the end is no longer a closed syllable. It becomes open because the tau becomes the consonant for the hiric yod of the first common singular pronominal suffix. That leaves the, the pathic under the samic open, which makes it long. Therefore, it is changed to a comment since it's an open syllable. All right? So that's why you see the comments used here instead of the pathic. It's become an open syllable, and therefore the long vowel is used. Susathi. Everyone? Susathi is my mare. All right? And your mare is Susathika. Notice the metheg added to the left of the comments to accent it and make certain that we take the following schwa as vocal. To make certain we take the following schwa as vocal, susatheka. Your uh, mare in the feminine singular is susathik. Susathik. His mare, susatho. Susatho. Her mare, susatha. Susatha. I heard some of you give a little bit more of the ha sound there at the end. Susatha. Susatha. Okay, I heard it, most of you now. All right. Our mare is Susathenu. Susathenu. Your masculine plural mare is Susathkem. Susathkem. But notice that's wrong because we don't have a dogish in the cough. It has to be Susathkem. Susathakem. So the question comes, why the pathic? Well, that's one of those mysteries. Here they chose not to use a method to keep it open. They chose not to use a comments to show it's open. They chose to use the absence of the dogish in the cough to tell us that it's open and that the schwa is vocal. All of these signals that we have to watch for. And actually, this is susa as an open syllable. And then thakem is the last syllable. Thakem. Susath thakem. Susath thakem. Everyone? Susath thakem. And then the feminine is susath thaken. Susath thaken. All right. It's very tricky. But you've got to pay attention to the fact that there's no dogish in the Bagadka Fath letter 
That's the signal that it's, fo that it's following an open syllable or a vowel that is vocalized. And here it's a vowel, it's the schwa, vocal schwa, that it is following. It's not initiating the syllable. It is actually the second consonant in the syllable. All right, their mare is susatham. Their mare feminine is susatham. Now, please keep in mind, when we talk about the plural here, we're not talking about the noun, we're talking about the pronoun. Okay? When we say feminine plural, it's the pronoun that's feminine plural, not the noun. Okay? The noun here is feminine singular. It's a feminine singular noun with a, fem a third feminine plural pronominal suffix. Then we move to davar. Remember, davar is the... Uh, the construct form of davar. And to add the pronominal suffix then, we just put the hiric yod on the end, and then it, just as we did with susath, because it makes it an open syllable, we're going to change most of the pathics to a comets again. So be used to seeing the comets being used here instead of the pathic of davar. Devari, Devari. means my word. Devarika. Devarika. Your masculine singular word. Devarik. Devarik. Your feminine singular word. Devaro. Devaro. His word. Devara. Devara. Her word. Her word. Literally, the word of her. Her word. If you're wondering why Shalom's down there in the corner, that's the word. All right? Okay. Devarenu. Our word. Devarakem. Notice that same clue there. You have a Bagad Kafath letter without a dogish, meaning it does not begin the syllable. So if it does not begin the syllable, then the schwa before it is vocal which means the pathic stands in an open syllable. Devarakem. Okay, devarakem. Everyone? Devarakem. Devaraken. Your feminine plural word. Devaram. Devaram. Their word. Devaran. Devaran. Their feminine plural word. Now, we have to go to the... Uh, plural noun, and when we go to the plural noun, we follow the same rules. We change the noun from its absolute form to its construct form. Horses is susim. The construct is susay. So we'll change to susay. Susot does not change. It does not change in the construct. It's that characteristically long vowel of the feminine plural ending, the ot ending. Devarim changes to divare. So we Add the pronominal suffix to the construct form of the plural noun. We follow the same rules. And so instead of my horses, it's literally the horses of me. The horses of me. Okay, my horses is susai. Susai. Now notice what has happened. We take susai, and if we're going to add a hiric yod to it, it becomes susai yi. But that is too odd and too out of uh, character with what the Hebrew wants to do or with the sounds it likes to do. So it decided that there'd be only one yod on the end. If you leave the hiric here, then it still is awkward. It's awkward pronunciation. The tsari yod here is actually a vowel. And so to try to change this yod and make it also a constant is awkward. So they combine the hiric and the tseri together. When they combine the hiric and the tseri together, there's no, nothing longer than the tseri yod to go to. So what they do is they re revert back to a standard vowel that is reverted back to on a large number of forms, and that is the pathic. And the pathic then together with the yod is a vowel sound itself. It becomes a sound that means ah, uh, that sounds like I. It's a long sound. It's literally I ye, but shortened up becomes I. So it's susai. 
So the, the constants are identical to what we see in Susi, my horse. Susai has a different sound on the end, and that's the clue that this is the plural noun. It's still the first common singular pronominal suffix, but it's the plural noun. So that Sari Yod has disappeared, and it's combined with the Hiric Yod to form a Pathic Yod. So Susai. Watch for that because that's the clue. When you see a pathic yod at the end of a word, it is in most cases, over 90% of the cases, it's going to turn out to be a first common singular pronominal suffix, my, on a masculine plural noun. On a masculine plural noun. This is tricky, but if you can keep susi and susai in your mind, Susi my horse, susai my horses. Susi my horse, susai my horses. Everyone repeat it. Susi my horse, susai my horses. All right? If you keep that in mind, you can keep it to where you'll remember it. Okay? Your horses is suseka. Notice that the yod is maintained as your clue that it's a plural noun. The yod is maintained as your clue that's a plural noun. It's shortened to a segol as the connecting vowel instead of a tseri. Okay? And uh, don't ask me why. Uh, and the master reads don't explain why. They just chose to do it. And it's one of those cases where you wonder why they couldn't have just kept the tseri. They keep it like with susenu, so why not here? But no, they went to a segol. And then they changed again, because when you get to the feminine second mass, the second feminine singular pronominal suffix, that is susake in the uh, in the uh, singular noun, your feminine singular horse susake. If they take horses plural and say susake, then they sound the same. So in order to distinguish between the two, they changed it to sasaik. Okay, susayik. Susayik is your feminine singular horses. And that's to distinguish between the uh, noun masculine singular with the second feminine singular pronoun suffix like susayik, your horse. Susayik, your horses. All right, his horses is susau. 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 Notice it would be a tseri, and here again I'm going to stand to give you this, but we take the tseri yod for the uh, construct, and if we add his as a holomwao, suseyo, again that's a sound that in Hebrew is not very common, in fact it's not a sound they, they really appreciate or like. You very seldom ever see a tseri and a holom together in this order. You'll see a holum and a tseri, but not a tseri holum. And so in order to get rid of this, they say, okay, if we put that together, a-o, then it, they can make it sound better if it's, they use the pathic before, remember, with the first common singular. So they heightened it to a comments so that it would have this same type of sound that would be given there if you have o, the ow is closer. And notice in, in English, we even use this sound for the same. We use an O for the same sound. And now all that is doing is taking that wow that is a vowel when it's the third masculine singular pronominal suffix and keeping it as a vowel. Now in modern Hebrew, they've decided to change the pronunciation on this type of, of word. And you'll hear in modern Hebrew, this is susav. They change the wow to a consonant in modern Hebrew. But that's not the way it was in classical Hebrew. In classical Hebrew, it was still retained as a vowel sound because the third masculine singular pronominal suffix is a vowel, a holum wow. And modern Hebrew has changed that. So it's susau in classical Hebrew, susav in modern Hebrew. Okay? Susau. Uh, I understand that in, in uh, the Yemenite Hebrew, it's still maintained here as a vowel, as susau. And that's uh, considered to be the closest Hebrew pronunciation to classical Hebrew, is the uh, Yemenite. 
Suseha. Her horses. Uh, notice that instead of having the comets hay, this is the hay and comets. So we pronounce it ha on the end. Suseha. Uh, that's a, again something you have to get used to for third feminine singular, for the third feminine singular pronominal suffix. Sometimes it's ha, sometimes it's ah. All right? Susenu. Our horses. Notice it's exactly the same as our horse, except for the yod. And so a question comes again, well, if they're going to do this with the first common plural, why couldn't they have done it for the second feminine singular as well? Well, they just didn't. They chose it. So the only difference here between, between our horse, Susenu, and our horses, Susenu, is that the horses has the yod in it. You have to see the yod, otherwise they're pronounced identically. They're pronounced identically. It's the yod that makes the difference for the plural horses. Okay, susekem, your horses, and susekin, your feminine plural horses. Notice that because of the open syllable before the Bagad Kafath letter, there is no dogish in the cough. Susay hem. Their masculine plural horses. Susay hen. Their feminine plural horses. My mares. Suso thai. Suso thai. Remember that the feminine plural doesn't change in the construct, so you have that oath there. Now, be aware that sometimes in Hebrew, the holom wow in the, a form like this will change to just a holom. It'll still be pronounced the same, susothai, but it'll be spelled with what they call a defective form rather than the full form. And if you just get used to hearing the oath in there as a feminine plural, it'll help you know that this is my mare, susothai. Notice instead of saying susothi, they stayed with a pathic yod that was present on the masculine plural noun, on susai. Susotheka. Susotheka. Your masculine singular mares. Susotayik. Susotayik. Your feminine singular mares. Susothau. Susothau. His mares. Susotheha. Susotheha. Her mares. Our mares is susotenu. Susotenu. Your masculine plural mares is susothekem. Susothekem. And excuse me, I put the accent on the wrong place. That's susothekem. Susothekem. The accent's on the last syllable. This is an unusual word. Why is it unusual? It's unusual in Hebrew because it has three full letter vowels. It has four vowels, no schwas. And it is uh, very unusual that way. Uh, the one before it, Susothenu, has four full letter vowels. You don't always see those types of words. This sus is an unusual word that way because it has one vowel that's characteristic and it's a long full letter vowel that it retains. And you'll not see that many Hebrew words that'll have this many syllables with these full letter vowels. Uh, it, it, it's very unusual. Most of the words in your Hebrew Bibles you're going through, you'll see schwas, you'll see half vowels. You'll see very few that have this type of vowel, vowel pointing all the way through. Your feminine plural mares is susay they ken. And their masculine pearl mares is susothe hem. Their feminine pearl mares, susothe hen. My words, divarai. Notice instead of divari, divarai. Divari, my words, divarai. Excuse me, divari, my word. Divarai, my words. My words. Your masculine singular words is divareka. divareka. Your feminine singular words, divaraik. divaraik. His words, divarau. 
Devaram. Her words, Devareha. Devareha. Our words, Devarenu. Devarenu. Your masculine plural words, Devrekem. Devrekem. Notice what's happened here? Because we had a schwa under the first letter, and then because we added a strong suffix that has to be accented. Notice the accent is moved away from the resh to the ending. Therefore, the third syllable back has to be as short as possible. And therefore, it drops to a schwa. We cannot have two schwas at the beginning of a word. So the first schwa changes to a hirik. That accounts for the hirik here. So it's div re chem, and it's a silent schwa. It closes the first syllable, makes it a short hirik. Div re chem. Everyone? Div, div re chem. chem. And in the feminine plural, div re ken. Div re chem. The third masculine plural words, div re hem. Div re hem. Their words, div re hen. Div re hen. So when you have the strong suffixes where the accent has to be placed on the suffix, which is on kim, kin, hem, hen. It was one of the answers you had on exercise 15 uh, that uh, you had to give the four heavy suffixes on, on the uh, ends of words. Those four are the heavy ones, so the accent is placed on. That's why they're called heavy, is they're accented. They're accented. And when that's done, then it changes the vowels on the rest of the word. Let's go to eighth. When we have eighth as a direct object marker, you have it pronounced oath, and then you add the pronominal suffix. It's othi, othak, and actually, excuse me, that's pronounced wrongly. I'm, I got ahead of myself. That's fe that's feminine singular. It's othaka, othaka, right? Because you have an open syllable, the holum. And then you have the tau, the begad kafaf letter, without a dogish. You have oth the ka, just like we had a ka in all of the other forms. This is also vocal schwa. Oth the ka, you masculine singular. Othak is you feminine singular. Okay? Othak is feminine singular. Otho is him. Othah is her. Othanu. Othanu. Don't make, it too, don't make it a real hard one. It's not otanu, it's othanu. It's like a th as in uh, thing. Yeah, as in thing as opposed to that. It's thing. It's a hard th, okay? Othanu. Everyone? Othanu. All right. Et the chem. Et the chem. Now notice again we have a bagad kafath letter without a dogish, which tells us then that the vowel before it is vocal, so it's a ethikem. Ethiken, you feminine plural, otham, them, and the feminine plural, othan. Now keep this in mind. When you have the O vowel with the eighth, that is when it's an object. When you have the I vowel, that's when it's the preposition with. Now, it's too bad they couldn't have done the same thing for the form without pronominal suffixes. But they didn't do it. They didn't, there's no distinction when you do not have the pronominal suffix. But when the pronominal suffix is there, they are distinguished. They have different forms. So the, the oath is the object. When you have the O, the O is an object. When you have the I, as in with, the it, and here it is the T sound, it, you'll have the with. All right, so when it means with, it's the prepositions, it, T. It T and it. Now notice here you have a tau with a dogish in it, but remember it had a dogish in it in the first common singular. It has a dogish everywhere. It is a hardening dogish, but it's also a doubling dogish. Therefore, it's as though there were two schwas here one that is silent and one that is vocal. So it's it the ka. It the ka, right. There's two T's. If you transliterate this, if you were to transliterate this, it would look this way. You'd have the ayan, you'd have the i for the hirik, you'd have the tau, 
and then you'd have the second syllable, another tau, and, and then what, what we're doing here? Uh, it the ka, excuse me. We want this this way. It the ka. All right. It the ka. So there's two T's in it. There's two T's in it. It's a doubling dogish as well as a hardening dogish in the Bagad Kafaf letters. So always keep the double T and always make your schwa vocal. It the ka. All right. The next one, it tak. It tak, okay. It to. It ta. It tanu. With us. It the kem. With you, masculine plural. It the ken. Is the feminine plural. It tam. With them. It tan. When it's feminine plural. All right, with Baith and Lamed, Li is to me. Notice you take it, normally has the schwa. Just put the hiric yod and place the schwa. Li, two or four me. Leka, two or four you. Lak, two or four you. Now there's one change here I'll warn you about. When Leka, the one that's second masculine singular, is in pause. If it is at the athnak, or if it's at the saluk at the end of a verse, it will be spelled lock as though it were second feminine singular. All right? So the second feminine singular form is exactly what the laka, second masculine singular form, will look like when it is in pause. Context will give you a clue because you'll know it's a second masculine singular antecedent but it will change in sound, and that throws a lot of people. It's not the last time you'll hear that. You'll hear it many, many times. That type of question will not appear on a quiz. It will not appear on your exam for OT 503, but in OT 504 next semester, I'll remind you of it again, that uh, in pause, laka becomes lock. Lo is to him. La is to her or for her. Be in me, with me, by me. Baka in you by you, with you, uh, Bach, the feminine singular you, Bo, in him, by him, with him, against him. There's all kinds of translations for the Baith, about 17 or 18. Bach, in her, Lanu, to or for us, Lachem, to or for you, Laken, to or for you, Lahem, Lahen, Banu, for the Baith, Bachem, Baken, Bahem, Bahen. Very steady, very consistent. The difference comes with a cough. Cough chooses to use what we call a poetic form. And let me clarify. When we say poetic form for some of these prepositions, we're not saying that this is the form that is used in poetry. This is the form used everywhere in the Old Testament, whether poetic or prose. But it's the, it's formed by taking what would be normally called a poetic form of the preposition and adding the pronominal suffixes to it. So don't let that confuse you. It's found everywhere this way. It's found everywhere this way, not just in poetry. When we talk about a poetic plural construct form of a preposition, which is an oddity to begin with, uh, it doesn't mean it's only in poetry. So it's kamoni, everyone. Kamoni, Kamoka, Kamoka, Kamok, Kamok, Kamohu. Kamohu. Notice that the O sound couldn't be put here. You couldn't couldn't say Kamoo. So instead of doing that, they use who, which is like we see it in the uh, third masculine singular personal pronoun. Kamoha, Kamoha, Kamonu, Kamonu, Kakem. Uh, With the strong suffixes, the heavy suffixes, it changes from the poetic form of cough to a standard form of cough, except for the comments that is there. Kakem, kaken, kahem. Notice it changes from the segol to a tsere. Kahain, and an alternate form, kahena. 
Boker Tov Givrin. Boker Tov. Mashlom Chem. Oh. oh, very good. <laughs> Is that because there's a short class today? <laughs> and we're going to have an even shorter recording session here. And let's go right to it. Let's go back and uh, take a look at min, uh, the pronominal suffixes on min. Uh, note the dogishes here. And I'll put this on the board. We have here mimeni. And that's because it is assumed that the original form was a reduplication of min. So that you have min from, and then again a reduplication of it from min. And then in order to add the hieric yod of the suffix, the first common singular suffix, another yod was necessary, under which, or noon was necessary, under which to place the hieric, and then the yod. And so this is the assumed original form. But the Hebrews, in looking at a form like that, uh, do not like all the noon sounds in it. To say min mini is easy, more easily said if you then assimilate these. So this first noon is then assimilated into the following name, indicated by the doubling doggish. The second noon is assimilated into the following noon, represented by the dogish, and therefore this can be removed and this can be removed, and the resulting form then is me, men, ni. Notice that here in the middle, instead of having three hierics, then the middle one is changed to a segol. And a segol is one of the favorite connecting vowels of the Hebrews when they're adding suffixes. You'll see that on a number of the forms we've looked at with pronominal suffix. Suseha, for example. Uh, her horses. We saw the segol and the yod there uh, represent. So mimeni. Everyone pronounce it? Mimeni. And the next one is mimek. Mimeka. Mimeka. Notice here that the, the noon was not needed as a connecting consonant. And so the second noon of the second min just disappears. It just disappears. Mimake. Mimake. Mimenu. Mimenu. Now notice here the clue that this is not the new of a first common plural. Remember, we've used, for example, Susainu, our horse. The noon shurik is often the suffix that is a first common plural, our. It's the suffix, remember, on the perfect verb. Uh, when we look at it, katalnu, you have he killed, mashalnu, uh, we ruled. You have the new suffix that is derived from the, per the personal pronoun anachnu or nachnu. So that nu is first common plural. This one, the noon, has a doggish in it. That's your clue that it is not first common plural. So when you see a noon and a shurik at the end of a word, and the noon does not have a doggish, that's first common plural normally. But if the noon has a doggish, that means it's the third masculine singular pronominal suffix. Okay? From him. Mimenu. From him. It's like having the who there, like we saw on kamohu. Except instead of the hey, we're using the noon which is treated as the best connecting constant here for the preposition min. Yes? Does the 
first common plural have the dog ish also? The first common plural will go on here. It might have the dog ish here because of men, but normally, in most cases, you will not find it. Okay. Uh, mimenna, everyone. Mimenna. From her. And here's what uh, Jeff is talking about. We have the exact identical form for the first common plural for the preposition min. It is the only case that you're going to have it that way. And it's because, again, you have the noon here that is being assimilated into it. Okay? So with min, you have a problem. You can't tell the difference between the two. Elsewhere, you'll be able to tell the difference. Elsewhere, you'll be able to tell the difference. On this, context and context alone tells you which is which because the forms are identical. Okay, mikem. Notice the dogish in the kaf. Even though we would have a vowel immediately preceding it, this is a doubling dogish because it is compensating for the assimilated noon of the min preposition. Therefore, it's as though it were mik with a kaf and a silent schwa, and then kem with a kaf and a segol. So it's actually duplicating the kaf. And so that's why you have the dogish here. It's a doubling dogish. Okay, mikem. And mikem. And mayhem. Mayhem. Why do we not have a hirik under the maim here? Why do we have a tsere? Not just heavy, one other reason. Okay, the guttural hay cannot take a doubling doggish. So then to compensate for the rejection of the doubling doggish, the hirik is heightened to a tsere. We saw that in attaching min to a noun like haaretz. It was me haaretz, remember? So it's because of the guttural that it's being rejecting the doubling doggish of the assimilated noon, and therefore to sh compensate for that, to demonstrate it, it the hirik is heightened to a tsere. John? So anytime something is compensated or taken away, something else has to change, or, or a vowel has to change, or a doggish has to be added. <coughs> in almost all cases, something has to take place, yes. Remember that in some cases it does not. Uh, we saw that, for example, in adding a uh, pronominal suff uh, or adding a, uh, uh, a definite article to a noun that begins with like a uh, chaith. Okay. Remember, it remained the same, the pathic under the hay of the article, but no dogish in the chaith because the chaith rejected it. But because the chaith is a strong guttural, it rejected the dogish, but it was doubled by implication. And so there are cases when compensation does not take place. But there's always a reason why it does not take place. So uh, it's one of those rules that has its exceptions. All right, the alternative form is mehema. All right, from them, the masculine plural. And we al also have two forms for the feminine plural, mehen, mehena. Mehena. All right. Now, coming to Al and L, and again, I want to emphasize that on Al and L, one of the first things we see is that we have an unusual thing take place. We expect a li, but in Hebrew, a li means my God. Remember in the Gospels, where you have Christ quoted as saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani? That is my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? A li is my God. So how do you distinguish between my God and unto me? One of the means of distinguishing is because of the fact that they have chosen to take L and to inflect it as though it were a poetic construct of a noun. And so it will have a yod with it. And remember, if you have a yod already at the end of a word in construct and you add the first common singular pronominal suffix, for example, we look at the word suce. Let's look at the word suce, horses of. When we add to suce a first common singular pronominal suffix, 
this was what we would expect. But again, the Hebrew does not want to have those two yods that way. And so what it does is it gets rid of this and it changes this to a pathic. Susai is my horses. My horses. All right? That's basically what's happening here. That's why we have a pathic yod. It's unto me as though unto were a noun in constructs and were a noun in construct plural. And that's what happens with el and with al. And we call it poetic because it's hypothetically a poetic form. It's not because these forms are found only in poetry because these forms are also found in prose. And in addition, it's uh, hypothetically a construct because some would indicate that this was originally an ancient noun that then became something used as though it were a preposition. So a lie means unto me. Everyone, a lie. A lekka. A lekka. Notice the yod there. That's because of that hypothetical poetic construct, plural construct, masculine plural construct, okay? A laic. Like. Notice it behaves in exactly the same way we had susaiik, your feminine singular horses. A lao. A leha. And then we'll go to the singular for al and we see the same thing. But notice that the al, meaning upon, above, over, or against, becomes a comments. Instead of having two pathics in a row, ally, it becomes a lie. Okay, so a lie. A lie. A leka. A lau. A lau. A leha. A leha. Another explanation for this changing to a comet is it's now in an open syllable. It's an open syllable rather than closed. If you have al, that's closed. But when you add to it, and then this first syllable, the ah, is open, then the pathic becomes a comma, it's a long vowel. Let's go to the plural forms. A lenu. A lekem. Now, notice here we have a change. In a lenu, we have all long vowels. But here, because the third syllable back, the third vowel back is so far back and we have a strong syllable, notice in a lenu, the a at the beginning is only the second syllable back from the accent. It's the third syllable back from the accent that must be as short as possible. Okay? Notice the accent over the lamed in a lenu. But here, the accent is on the heavy pronominal suffix, kem, ken, hem, and hen are heavy. So the accent stays with them. Therefore, that makes the aleph the third back from the accent. And so therefore, it's going to be shortened. And here it becomes then a uh, hatif pathic, a short vowel. Elekem, everyone? Elekem. Eleken. Elehem. Elehen. And the same in al, alenu. Notice that it's accented on the lamed, so therefore the a ah is not the third syllable back. But now it's going to be the third syllable back, therefore it has to be shortened, so it becomes elekem. Eleken. Elehem. Elehen. All right. Any questions that you have on these as we're getting now down to the end of this class session? We've been able to finish this up, finish up chapter 15 for you. Any questions that you might have? Some of these you just have to go over and over again and uh, just read them until they become part of your, I'm not asking you to memorize, but if you become familiar with them because of constant repetition, uh, then when you see a mimenu, a mimenna, a mimen, a mikem, miken, you immediately recognize it. You're not confused by it. 
So here it's the, the key is repetition in reading and pronouncing. Not memorization, but just repetition. Because then it's familiar. It's like you didn't memorize the way you get to seminary. It's by constant repetition. The first time you drove it, you may have taken a wrong turn somewhere. Uh, the next time you drove it, you didn't take the wrong turn there. Maybe you took a wrong turn somewhere else. But pretty soon, you're doing the same thing. It's not because you memorized the route necessarily. It's because you didn't sit down with a map and memorize it. You didn't memorize directions. It's because of constant repetition. You know it. And there's things along your route that you're used to seeing too. Some of it you, we become kind of oblivious to after a while. We take for granted. But there are certain things we see, not because we memorize it, but because it's constant repetition. We know approximately how long it takes us normally to get to the 210 if we're coming down the 5 from the north from Santa Clarita. And it's not memorization. It's just that it's that constant repetition. Language is the same. Constant repetition embeds those sounds and concepts in your minds to when the next time you see them, you say, oh, that's familiar. And if it's familiar, then it must be that it's because of men that I'm used to hearing the sound, me menu, me menna, etc. You're used to it. And it doesn't throw you. So don't try to memorize every single form of men or every single form of the cough preposition or of, el or of al. Just read them over and over. I would suggest during the Thanksgiving break that for this chapter you just go through and just say I'm going to take 10 minutes this morning to read one of these paradigms. Just read it out loud. And then lay it down and forget about it. And come back next day and read the next one. And by the time you get back, you will have read through all those paradigms in chapter 15 about two or three times. And if you have more time, you know, read them all through. But that's the way that language is gained. Repetition, repetition, repetition. That's why I use repetition here in teaching.